one reason for studying acoustics is that many of us are disturbed by loud noise uh, on a daily basis. Uh, percussive rock drill like this, for instance, emits very, very loud noise, in particular for the operator, but also for uh, residents in the neighborhood. For the operator, hearing protectors like this is a must in order to avoid developing hearing impairment. Key questions for <clears throat> tool manufacturers, employers, authorities and regulators is how much noise tools like this emit, how disturbing or even dangerous the noise is, and how to assess this on a numerical scale. These are questions that we will touch upon in the coming presentation. How are we affected by sound? Well, some sounds make us happy and relaxed, like this one, for instance, bird song. It's fun pouring water. This one, a mother humming a lullaby for her kid. <laughs> These are all examples on sounds that from tens of thousands of years of human development had made us comfortable, relaxed, and happy. Of course, there are opposite sounds. Thunder, for instance. Tonal sounds, like this. Alarm here. So, in order to get some kind of assessment on how we are affected by sounds, how we perceive different types of sounds, we need methods to assess the annoyance and health uh, issues of sounds. So are there such methods? Well, already in the 1930s, uh, the Fletcher and Munson equal loudness contours were developed. They are, yeah. well, the equal loudness contours are basically sound pressure level versus frequency curves, where the, which shows how human perceive a single frequency tone as equally strong as a reference tone. And uh, these equal loudness contours are actually still used in a number of very, very often used methods to assess and quantify how we perceive sound. So this curve here shows uh, a set of equal loudness contours. And <clears throat> as you can see here, a single of the contours um, shows, well, the sound pressure level versus frequency. And uh, from the set of curves here, you can also see how this um, sensitivity, how the equal loudness contours change with strength of the sound. 
So these are low sounds in the lower region here, and these in the upper region are strong sounds. So this dashed curve here at the bottom is the hearing threshold. And that shows the minimum sound pressure level that can be detected by the human hearing system versus frequency. So for instance here, if we take a sound at 125 hertz, this the hearing threshold shows that well, roughly 22 dB decibels is required from a tone at 125 hertz to be possible to be detected by a human, normal hearing human. So these two curves here, the blue and green one, shows two examples of equal loudness contours. The blue one is the 70 form curve and the green one is the 90 form curve. And the definition now of this uh, notation is based on the sound pressure level at 1000 hertz. So if you see here, if you take the 1000 hertz frequency and go up here, we see that the 70 form curve is 70 dB at 1000 hertz, whereas the 90 form curve, the value of the sound pressure level is 90 dB, as you can see here, at 1000 hertz. So that is the notation system of these equal loudness curves. So if you now take this 70 phone curve and start at the definition here uh, at 1000 hertz, then you can see that the lower the frequency is, the higher uh, sound pressure level you need to in order to perceive this sound as equally strong as the sound 70 dB at 1000 Hz. So that is how the 70 form curve is defined. You can also, like I said before, uh, get a sort of um, indication on the amplitude dependence of how we perceive single frequency sounds. And that is possible then if you see uh, the, <clears throat> um, the set of these contours here, how they, the frequency variation change when you increase the strength of the curve. So the stronger the noise, the flatter the equal loudness contour. So we are, the stronger the noise, the lesser the variation versus frequency is. So sound pressure level in dB, that is actually a physical strength measure, which actually has enough, well, very little to do with how we as humans perceive uh, noise. So we actually need some kind of subjective strength measure. Uh, and the idea then is to use this equal loudness contours as sort of frequency weighting filters. So if we apply this frequency weighting, we can transfer the physical strength method, measure to a subjective measure that indicates how we perceive the noise. So sounds with low perceived strength then many standards uh, start from the 40 fold curve. And from the 40 fold curve, we define this A weighting curve. That is the most commonly used um, frequency weighting curve. If we have higher perceived strength, then we usually take the 100 fold curve and we define the C weighting curve from this 100 fold curve. So this graph here, the red one uh, shows the A weighting <clears throat> filter curve and the blue one shows the C weighting filter curve. And uh, maybe it's difficult to see, but actually the A weighting curve is sort of the mirrored, um, well, is sort of the 40 form curve mirrored 
in the frequency axis. And then uh, it's, uh, well, adjusted so that the uh, value at 1000 hertz, one kilohertz is zero. And the same goes for all these weighting curves. So the red one, the red curve here, the A weighting filter is the most commonly used frequency weighting filter in order to convert a physical strength given by the sound pressure level to a subjective uh, measure on how we perceive noise. So, in order to um, convert this sound pressure level in dB to the A-weighted sound pressure level, we simply add this A-weighting delta A for the different frequencies that is contained in the frequency spectra. So, after this addition, we have the, ob obtained the A-weighted sound pressure level. And the same goes for the high noise levels, but then we use the C weighting filter instead of the A weighting. Typically aircraft noise, jet engine noise, that's a typical situation where you use the C weighting filters instead of the A weighting filters. Very often these filters are used in third octave bands or octave bands. So this is very common then in standards and regulations. So this table here shows the A weighting field, the A weightings in octave band. So in the octave band with center frequency 31.5 Hertz, for instance, we have the A weighting minus 39.4 and so on. And as you can see here, and one kilohertz, the value is zero. So a large negative value actually means that we are, relatively speaking, insensitive to noise in that particular frequency band. So here you can see that from this, well, in this octave band that is given in the table, we are most sensitive in the two kilohertz band. Now, like I've said a number of times now, these frequency weighted sound levels, and in particular the A weighted sound level, is very, very commonly used as noise disturbance measures in standards and regulations. But there is always buts. What happens if the noise exposure, if the sound pressure level varies with time? In a working place, for instance, if you use a tool that's a noisy tool a couple of hours a day and then in the remaining time it's fairly silent so how can we get sort of a total subjective assessment of a typical working day well the hypothesis then is that the total acoustic energy that your ears receive is the important parameter in this situation. So we need them to sum the acoustic energy, the A-weighted acoustic energy. And that is, well, as you may know now, the um, mean uh, square sound pressure is actually proportional to the acoustic power or acoustic energy. So if you sum these or time integrate these, over a working day, then you will come up with the total acoustic energy received. So this is the measure that is used in many cases, the equivalent A-weighted sound pressure level. So this time integral here sums, as you can see here, the mean square, and this A here denotes the A-weighted mean square, meaning that you have apply this A weighting filter. So you sum it over the times. Now this T OBS here is normally a working day, eight hour working day. And then you take the base 10 logarithm and multiply with 10 in order to get the decibel, um, the dB unit, the dB value. 
to give some examples here, uh, the World Health Organization Europe Division for road traffic noise, it strongly recommends the 24 hour, I mean, day night noise exposure in this equivalent A weighted sound pressure level to be lower than 53 dBA. This parenthesis A means that it's A weighted. It also strongly recommends the nighttime exposure because we're supposed to sleep during nights to be lower than 45 dBA. So that is one typical example. Sometimes if the noise typically contains tones, strong tones, then it's even more strong, these requirements. Another example is wind turbine noise. VHO Europe Division strongly recommends the 24 hour noise exposure to be lower than 45 dBA in this case. So it's even stronger than the road traffic noise. Okay, that was the first but, but there is a second but. Quite often, actually, this um, A weighted or C weighted. Um, sound pressure levels are a bit too blunt, so it does not capture the annoyance that we feel when we are subjected to various kinds of noise. This is one example. It's taken from a first-class train compartment. It's actually a door that is knocking while vibrating back and forth and bouncing in the, the supports when the train uh, is train cabin uh, well, compartment is vibrating them when it's running over the, the rail. So this is very annoying, you know, when you, for instance, if you have to prepare for a meeting during your train journey. So for this reason, more advanced disturbance and annoyance measures have been developed. And that has been done mainly in the psychoacoustic area. So uh, we have, for instance, Swicker loudness or psychoacoustic annoyance that was developed in the 80s and 90s mainly. And we have other parameters that can capture, um, well, various characteristics of sounds. Uh, these are, for instance, tonality, which, as the name suggests, captures a large content of tonal frequencies in the, in the um, uh, sound. We have sharpness, that is actually a measure of the high frequency content. The higher uh, the high frequency content is, the larger the sharpness is. Then, then we have fluctuation strength, that is actually a measure on how the... Uh, amplitude modulation of the sound is, and it's actually for modulation frequencies lower than 20 hertz. And they have some, also have something called roughness, and that's also actually an, an amplitude mod modulation character, characteristic. But that is for higher frequencies. So there are a number of, of um, uh, parameters used to quantify these more advanced psychoacoustic parameters of, of um, how we perceive noise. One example here is on a large fluctuation strength is this wind turbine noise. As you can hear, Fluctuates the amplitude, the strength is fluctuates in time. Now we can get to And this is perceived as very annoying. So that's all for now.